love my HBCU. And boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah, yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouse. But if they won, she tap. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talkin they know what they be talking about. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot of And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. Good morning, lab listeners. It's a great morning boy i know it may be weary for some but it's a great morning just want to let you know to lift up your spirits all is well all is well in the swag world hbcu feed them just wanted you to know again welcome to episode 580 of inside the hbc sports lab podcast and the podcast the show that's covering the sporting hbcu dash for all things hbcu sports from institutions large and small from the neia to the ncaa we share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBCU sports. Simply put, we just call it HBCU sports pedagogy. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Kavir, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. You're welcome, Charles. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to Case Wage 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer. Multi Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper in a beautiful home at Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. It's a great Sunday morning. Let's bring on our additional additions as we talk about. It. Yes, Charles. Good morning. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, Nick Mike. How are you doing this morning, Mike? This, this Man, green it's, looks so purple today. <laughs> Man, it's just, just just a beautiful day. It's something about the weather. It's, it's, it's the moisture's great. I mean, it's the birds are chirping and. You know, it's it's you know Shakespeare had a saying: "Beware of the Ides of March." Mm. Nah, and now in 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 HBCU, beware of the Ides of November. This is true. This uh, is CB true. and I were talking about that. That woo, yep. It's a beautiful morning. Thank you. You're welcome, Charles. You know Johnny T should just have a special spot for Prairie <laughs> Folk. <laughs> No doubt about it, Johnny. Johnny, 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 Johnny. Cause I booked. <laughs> I booked mine as well. I saw it coming. I booked last week. I tried to tell you. I tried to tell you. Oh. And we got good sport, AD Drew in the building. Welcome to the show, AD Drew. Appreciate all you do. I, I, I have my black on. <laughs> And I understand Damn. why. Damn, you goes out. Tuskegee, Tuskegee goes, Tuskegee goes out. out. And wow. the house goes out. Damn. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, AD. It, it was a tough one. I had a black on. Yeah. <laughs> That's very appropriate. Very appropriate. So and I invited Brian, you know, the other half of the sports rap. I, I think he may have had a long night yeah, uh, in terms true. of the, oh. the bottle to kind of make sure that things went well. <laughs> uh, you know, some people like to drink their sorrow up. So <laughs> shout out to Brian. But it would be accurate, though, that, you know, one of the founding members of the SWAC, the lone remaining founding member of the SWAC, made sure that they appropriately welcome FAMU to the SWAC uh, for the first time that they've come to visit Prairie View. <laughs> in the greater Houston area, we just wanted to make sure that we let you know that there are other teams that are able to beat you and allowed to beat you in the swag besides Jackson State. <laughs> so we just we just wanted to do that and tell the guys, chill out, man. The band is the band. Y'all can y'all welcome to bring y'all band. Y'all can bring your band. You ain't got to get they mad at the band because they decide yeah. to play a couple they, of songs. They didn't have to storm at, oh, have to storm at the band oh, after oh, the game. Okay. Shots fired! Shots fired! Oh my goodness. That was a little man. They tough. They tough characters. I mean, it happens. You know, teams win, teams lose. You can't always win. You know, but uh, I guess it's a little touching. A little touching. Just, just, just touchy. saying. Just saying. Touchy, touchy. 
<laughs> With that being said, y'all, y'all on today's talk. episode of Inside the HBC Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency. THG Agency is a company that provides sporting, educational, and data analytics. Charles, what were you saying? I said you guys are tough. Y'all, y'all, y'all rough on the brothers from Tallahassee. Y'all, y'all rough, man. We just, we just, we just want them to welcome them appropriately. You know, that's all I want. No, no harm, no foul. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we threw a master tailgate, and it turned out to be a tailgate for fam. At least just before the game, the game, everybody disappeared. Oh man, they were singing their strikes, and they was on they the mic. They had a duo. They were striking, all and all I mean, the they were fired up. I mean, that orange looked good. The green, I, I'm not like Jackson State or Southern. Particular Carlos, that says that he just has a problem with it. I actually kind of like the colors, you know, they work out really well, yeah. but it dissipated quickly after the game. I didn't, I didn't understand I what saying. happened. I mean, they were fired up, ready to party. We, we was like, hey, we here, let's have a good time. You know, we had everything set up, we allowed them to have their colors and all yeah. that kind of stuff, and, and tents and orange, and we had tents and purple and white, just to, you know, good collage, good mix. A DJ from FAMU, a DJ yes. from Prairie View, and the DJ from FAMU left. <laughs> yeah, 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 just left. We like, where did he go? It's supposed to be a battle. I don't know how people leave before they start to battle. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't. I mean, you, know, you have Panthers and, Panthers and Rattlers shaking hands, drinking, eating together, singing Kumbaya. We clearly stated that no matter what happens in the game, we party in after the game. That, what happened? That after all- the game? That only sounds good when you are the victor. <laughs> wow. Hey, yeah, folks talking about say, man, we're gonna put the 30 on you, you know, all that. I say, oh, okay. I say, man, I say, don't do that. Don't be okay. Then I came back to check Wait, to see about the you, 30. You misunderstood, Dr. Kavir. They said we're gonna give up 30. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, let me get into some of these updates because um, we have the championships uh, in terms of CIAA and SIEC, and I know Drew is going to want to get into that. Anything before you get there? Yeah. Why does it take PV beating Bam U for Mike to show up on Sunday? <laughs> Yeah, somebody, somebody in the chat already said. <laughs> I knew Michael was gonna show up. <laughs> question of the day. That's a good one. That's a good question. Well, let's get in here uh, and get mix it up in terms of these scores. Uh, you had the big rivalry game: Tuskegee Golden Tigers. They fall to five and five, five and three outside of the SIC. They needed this game. They were at home. Uh, the lights. Even though the game was played early, they had a record crowd, though. You had a record crowd uh, for this year and for their homecoming over 45,047, I think, to be exact. Yeah, 47 to be exact of that. So, congratulations to that. No doubt, all seriousness, big thing. But in terms of the game, uh, it didn't go there well at all 37 to 7. We have our little uh, page that we do uh, in terms of Messenger and. Uh, Miles players, a couple of them did a the rap battle uh, blast that was hilarious. Oh my god! <laughs> to the Biggie rap, <laughs> and they did a good job on that. Um, Giggy updates on Florida Memorial Lions, West Virginia State uh, Yellow Jackets. But let's get into the top seven due to time. Flor- uh, Fort Valley Wildcats lost to Albany State Golden Rams. 20 to 15, uh, upset in some people's world, but not to be that much. But it certainly pushed uh, Fort Valley State out of the SIC championship game. If they had won that, they were in with the loss. Um, it actually knocks both teams out 6 4, 6 and 2, which means number six, the Clark Atlanta Panthers, that defeated the Morehouse Maroon Tigers 28 to 17, improved to 6 2 and 1, 5 and 2. Uh, they are in the SIAC championship game. Remember early this season when I told y'all, consider about Clark Atlanta. Look mm. at it now. They are playing mm. for a championship. So that rat poison, that rat poison, <laughs> remember a little bit about that rat poison? Yeah, now y'all really know about that rat poison. <laughs> 
They got Let's one final you. chance next Saturday. All on the road. They go to Miles. It's a rematch. They lost at home. Now they get a chance to see if they can get a little revenge. And if they can, guess what? They hold up a SIC championship. Who would have even thought they would be in this position? Wow. Once the Salem State, they win this past weekend. They improved to 73. Um, five and two. What an incredible season for them. Uh, Virginia State Trojans defeat the number one Virginia Union Panthers, probably the upset of the weekend. Uh, yep. Many people thought it would be an intriguing game, but a few, very few truly picked uh, the Trojans. They went 35 to 28. Um, at number three, Miles Golden Bears, as we said, defeat Tuskegee Golden Tigers 37 to 7, 8 and 2, 8 0. They had clinched their spot in the SIAC, uh, and they will be hosting the championship. Now they know who they will play, which, as I said, is Clark Atlanta. So you're going to have a top seven matchup in the SIC championship game, which is appropriate. At number two, uh, Johnson C. Smith Golden Bulls lost the Livingston Blue Bears. Let me say that again. They lost the Livingston Blue Bears 15 to 12. We were up in the suites watching the end of that game. Um, they were down 15 to uh, five, whatever. They scored late to make it uh, 15, 10 or whatever. Late in the game, they got the crucial stop. With about two and a half, and they were actually a little beyond midfield. Um, made a good play, first down, second down. Quarterback was rushed a little bit through late uh, to the left side of the field in the flat, and the defensive back undercut it, caught the interception. And essentially, the game was over, which meant the Johnson C. Smith magical season comes to an end with a tough loss, and also puts them outside of the CIAA championship because of the victory of virginia state and their loss uh virginia union who was previous number one was one for a week they lose so it'll be interesting to see who's number one uh probably you have to lean what maybe the miles who's at three we'll see officially mm -hmm. on tuesday how it all stacks up and all the voters brandon is sending his stuff ad drew is sending his votes charles mike you can send in yours you have time uh, as we get to the end probably more important appropriate time to get that in but Virginia Union loses 35 to 28, which means in the CIAA, the championship will be a rematch uh, of the game that was just played this weekend between Virginia Union and Virginia State, which would be interesting for a championship uh, in terms of those two colliding. This time, it's not just to see who will play in the championship game. It's going to be who gets to raise the, trap, the trophy, I should say, for a CIAA football championship. It'll be interesting to see potentially both of these teams can get bids. Once some Salem State was in that seven, what does this look like? Um, in terms of that, obviously that Clark Atlanta Miles Championship will be big, as Drew has told us in terms of those regional rankings. So we shall see. Uh, let me go to you all and just get y'all thoughts on the mid major. Obviously, we came in talking about major <clears throat> division, the the big upset for a lot of folks. Obviously, it was Prairie over FAMU. Uh, but uh, it really got a little interesting uh, in the mid-major. Charles? Uh, you know, the Smurf turf, it tripped up Johnson C. Smith. I think that's the one that jumps out for me. I mean, when you take a look at it, Johnson C. Smith, they had one job. And back-to-back uh, -back weeks, they couldn't get it done. And uh, for such a tremendous season to kind of turn on his head towards the end, I mean, we, we, we say it all the time, just things get dicey in November. You never know what might get happen. Uh, I said you, you're probably going to have some head-turner games. That was a head turn game for me. I did not see uh, Livingstone knocking out Johnson C. Smith. Oh, man, they already talking about fumbling. Johnson C. fumbling, they hopes away. It was an <laughs> interception, man. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what was your thoughts? Yeah, for me, it, it's not just about the game. I, I agree with CB that <clears throat> Man, we, we started off the season, Johnson C. Smith this, Johnson C. Smith that. They were undefeated, could nobody, and then they hit a few stumps. But to me, it was about the race. You know, you had four teams with, you know, one, you know, two losses that could have easily run this, you know, between Virginia State, Union Smith. Um, and it was just interesting how it played out. And now you'll have an all-Virginia you know, CIAA championship who would have thought this at the beginning of the season? But that race toward the end and the team, the horse that you thought was not going to make it, hit a few stumbles. It, it's, it's more fascinating about the race than just that one game. Mm. 
to your point, Mike, I, I think a lot of folks actually would have saw Virginia Virginia State, but after the season started to play, uh, coming to you, Drew, to get your thoughts, I think it is disappointing to some degree after sure. what was previously the Southern Division had their greatest season uh, in terms of the depth of the teams in the Southern Division and actually played out of their favor, uh, that they essentially beat each other up. Yeah. To the point that neither yeah. of those teams will be playing for a championship. And then you add on uh, insult to injury with St. Paul previously out of the – I mean, St. Augustine previously out of the Southern Division having to give up its football season. And the way things played out, you actually have a John C. Smith that has beaten both of these teams <laughs> and will not be in the championship because yes. one of them uh, didn't count as a loss. Uh, just and that's just how things set up. I mean, it was put out there early, so it wasn't like some type of conspiracy. But I just think it is tough when you think about all that. That that's just the way it played out. Uh, Drew, your thoughts? Interesting. Uh, we said this was going to happen. We said the SIAC was going to sneak back into the race. Now, SIAC. Probably going to have the number one team next week. Yep. After mm. a yep. couple of weeks, well, all you saw was Clark Atlanta. And then you didn't see Clark Atlanta or anybody for a minute. Yep. So, but wasn't it exciting between the two conferences? Yes. There were about eight games that you had to watch. Yes, because yep. there were no divisions. Yep, I mean that was to me that was the fascinating part, the race between yeah, those teams. Yeah. Watch watch the teams wins, lose, be, be competitive, and then for the Allen Ever Waters game, which had nothing to do with either those two teams getting in, but because of all the tiebreakers, actually having to wait on the result of that game. To see who got in? Oh, it was fun yesterday. Yeah. yeah, great point, great point. And we'll get a little bit of that into the major division after this first break. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the SIC that you kind of uh, spoke about a little bit, Drew. So I'm, I'm going to go back to Charles and Mike, uh, starting with you, Mike, first. What are your thoughts about Clark Atlanta uh, getting into the championship after starting off the season with the bang and ultimately that road win for Valley State? Uh, is a huge determining factor uh, at the close of the season after Albany State um, wins the Fountain City Classic against the rival Fort Valley State. They, and the win by Clark Atlanta allows them to play for a championship in the SIEC. Yeah, that, I, I guess I I think it's it's destiny. It's like, you know, cheesy word, but but destiny. We, talk, we started the season talking about the rat cheese, right? <laughs> and here it is at the end of the season. A team that they beat, I believe, at the very beginning of the season, that is the team that loses and helps them, helps catapult them into uh, the championship. So it's amazing how things run. If, if memory serves me, I think they lost to Fort Valley. Game Fort one. Valley is gaining momentum. Is that uh, Drew? You you're my expert, and and could conceivably be in the championship. Loses. In the uh, the in the Fountain City Classic, and all of a sudden that that catapults them back into the championship. How can you uh, categorize it in any other way that this is just a season, you know? So so had had solved, but I, I just find it fascinating how that that chase worked out. But that rat poison just came back in the end, Doc. Mm. Doc, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to pick my damn lottery numbers because you started <laughs> talking about seriously. You started talking that at the very beginning, and everybody like Doc's off his rocker. What's wrong with Doc? And here we are. The rat poison hit it. So, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. And think about this, Charles. Mm -hmm. From zero and ten, yeah, the yeah. championship game appearance. You know, going six and two in the conference. A uh, huge statement. Uh, probably the toughest loss, obviously, is Lane, or they really would have had a season uh, to remember. But now they really have a chance to make the final statement. But zero and ten. Uh, this should be all over the newspapers in Atlanta in terms of what they were able to do, particularly uh, with Morehouse, Spellman.
Clark Atlanta, what they're able to do with first take on Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, big battle of the cats on Saturday. Clutch win and going down. It's, it's huge. Yeah, I, I think you touched on it. I mean, to go from 0-10 uh, to playing in the championship game, you're talking about the, a facelift of a program. You can't say enough about what Teddy Keaton has come in and done and, and, and brought this uh, football program uh, to prominence. Uh, I, 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 you know, the, the transfers coming in from Allen, uh, David Wright leading his team and really following his team all season. Like you said, you put them on notice early, and, and Coach Keaton had to, had to try to tamp that down a little bit. Uh, but, you know, the, the, that first head turn of game, when they knocked off the Thune Cookman, then everybody really, yep. you know, had to pay attention uh, to what Clark was doing over there. I, probably even the first game, that, that was a head turner. Uh, but, I mean, for them to continue the momentum during the course of the season, uh, a stumble along the way, but to find themselves back in the championship game, just a tremendous, tremendous season watching Clark Atlanta football. Drew, I'm going to let you put the cherry on top of this in terms of being there, uh, doing your responsibilities. You got to see uh, the Big Cat Classic. What were your thoughts in terms of the momentum, just in the energy associated? In a lot of ways, it really started early in the week, culminating with the Friday uh, first take and then Saturday with the big game. Uh, Well, I'll start off with Friday. Talk to uh, Teddy after the uh, first take event. We talked back in in the green room. And, uh, you know, yeah, we are two different schools, but Teddy and I, you know, have a relationship. We go back a few years of, with our personal relationship. And we room. talked about just having to come out and handle business because he was afraid Morehouse would come in because of the rivalry and everything else and upset him. So he, he was making sure that his, his kids were focused. They're ready to handle their business. And then after that, it, it is what it is because they had no control. And for, for Valley wins, hey, great season, Clark. But for Valley loss, Tuskegee yep. was a non-factor because they had the head-to-head over Tuskegee. So it was just uh, it was just fun. Almost 10,000 people there in attendance for the uh, Big Cat Classic. Giving away scholarships, trophy, you know, that trophy. I hope don't get comfortable over there because it's coming back home next year. But that's <laughs> sidebar. Hey, yeah, I, I, I have to tell you. Hey, hey, I just, I, I mean, I like how you kind of just <laughs> dropped that casually. Uh, yeah, me and Teddy, we were talking back there in the green room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah, that was smooth. That was smooth. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, 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 seriously, though. I do have to take a point of special privilege for 47,000 people at Tuskegee, probably another mm-hmm. 15 to 20,000 just hanging out around town. And unfortunately, there was an incident yesterday. Reportedly, oh. there were a couple of people who were shot and possibly deceased. Uh, just want to send thoughts and prayers out to my Tuskegee community. I know a lot of people still live there that I have friendships with. So I just want to uh, take a couple of moments and uh, send my thoughts and prayers out to the Tuskegee community. And, and same thing in regards to sending thoughts and prayers to Mississippi Valley State as they lost a young man, Ryan Quinn, uh, in a car accident uh, prior to this Jackson State game. So definitely our thoughts and prayers go out to the uh, it being community. With that, we'll have a moment as we go into the break uh, in terms of both tragedies um, yeah. of what's going on. We hear far too much of that in terms of HBCUs, but it's a reflection of America in terms of gun violence at every level uh, throughout the country. And far too many people are losing their lives tragically uh, when there are other ways that uh, we can find a way to move forward. So take this moment and then we'll get into the break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. 
supermarket sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? Oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Standard protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Hey, grab me one too. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll it back, everybody. <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watch and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love you, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Will inside the HBC Sports Lab as we turn the page into the major division. Let's see what happened in the top seven and those teams just out of it. Essentially, uh, the next three, which will give you the 10 teams we'll look at, starting with uh, the first one out, uh, Prairie View A&M Panthers defeated number four for A&M Rattlers 31 to 12, a major part of that game. It was early in the game. Uh, quarterback Richardson uh, went out with a concussion in Prairie View. Actually jumped on the board early, um, which they hadn't been able to do, scoring and playing from in front really big. And then they, instead of holding on, they actually stretched out the lead late in the game. Alcorn State Braves defeated Texas Southern Tigers. It was close early, 14-14 at one time. And then the Braves uh, pushed it out and got it done, 42-21, to keep their hopes alive in the – Western Division, uh, as they are still in that race. Hampton Pirates, they lost to Townsend Tigers 27 to 10, so they fall to 5 and 5 and 2 and 4 on the season to kind of uh, push their way outside of what's going on in the CAA. At number seven, the Tennessee State Tigers, a lot of people said this was a referendum. They really needed to bounce back. Well, they did it in a major way and had a major statement against the Western Alliance Bulldogs. They went 45 to 20. They improved to 73, 4 and 2 on the season. Big win in terms of just bouncing back from a tough loss last weekend. It was uh, fascinating to see. Saw a couple of those Tennessee State fans out there at Prairie View. Uh, so it's fascinating to see all that going on as they went forward again. It's finding a way to get out to the game. Um, fascinating to see. At number six, Southern Jaguars just do what they do. Cardiac, Jaguars, kids, I don't know what you want to call them. Jumping, joy, uh, whatever. But they defeat Bethune-Cookman Wildcats. Um, they were down 10-3 in the fourth quarter, get a big drive to score a touchdown, to send it to overtime, and then they have to play five overtimes. Well, it's not the first time this season they played overtime. A prayer view, Texas Southern. Um, yep. And they find a way to win. If they can get it to overtime, don't worry about it. They're going to get it done. Uh, they win 25-3. Go for two. Go for two. Three. Uh -huh. <laughs> Say you playing Southern, go for two. Yeah, <laughs> go for two early, early and often. Yes. With that being said, um, 
they are squarely uh, looking at Western Division Championship in the mirror. Um, they need to get one of the final two, and they can lock it up uh, no matter what all point because they have that head-to-hand on two games left. We shall see. It's fascinating. Talking about another team that finally lost the close one is out or the team that won the close one. I guess it depends on what side of the corner you're on. Alabama State goes into the hole, uh, controls the game for most of it, goes back and forth. Big plays late in the game to get downfield. It looked like they were going to set up for a a pretty pedestrian uh, field goal to win it and send all the GSU folks in a tizzy as they just (laughs) did not win. Uh, But uh, Groundless State, though, uh, found a way to get it done and kind of rebound after they've had a tough couple of weeks. And the field goal slides right, just like uh, Charles, as he sees uh, some of those folks out there on the golf course when they slice it. That's what he did. I know it's not you, Charles. Make sure I said that. I want to know how. <laughs> some of the other folks be taking their money when they get a little nervous when the money gets big. He slices it. Well, that's what happened here. Uh, shout out to John Grant. I saw he was down there uh, getting a little bit of the mid major love in Georgia in, but he'll have, probably have to go to South Carolina this week or Morgan, I should say, actually on the road because South Carolina State talk about teams that can. Uh, Punch their tickets. They're right there up on it. Uh, but we'll get to them shortly. We're on Alabama State. Loses 24-23, to 5-4, and 4-4-2. Four, four and two. It doesn't quite wrap up things in the Western Division, just so you know. There are two remaining games. Um, so, theoretically, this matchup with Jackson State is still big. Uh, Jackson State would have to lose two of the last. I don't see that, but it is against teams that uh, find a way to get up for them with Alabama State. Montgomery is tough in terms of uh, the gump over there, as well as the fact Alcorn, they got to go to Alcorn. Two rough games. If they can get out of this, they deserve to actually close out the season where they are. Meaning number four, Florida Rattlers, lost to Prairie Bay and Panthers 31-12, 5-4, 3-2. Two. Technically, it doesn't seal the deal. It really makes it hard. They looking for, still have the chance of three-way tie. But the way it goes, I'm not sure that it would go in their favor if you find the three-way tie. I know the Jackson fans, D.I. Love, said, don't worry about that. We're going to lock it up next week. We shall see. At number three, North Carolina Central Eagles, they were fans of Howard Bison after all their stuff that happened the last couple of years. That was hard to watch and see, but uh, it didn't matter. They didn't play <laughs> in because number two, South Carolina State Bulldogs defeated Howard Bison 38-14. to I don't know how much the Eagles were cheering, but it didn't work. Mm. Bulldogs improved to 7-2 and 3-0 and uh, with two games left and the head-to-head. Their matchup against uh, Morgan State next week uh, basically is for the conference championship. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Particular uh, with Morgan State has quietly, they've won after that first loss to North Carolina Central. So if they went out, they actually would represent the MEAC because they would have the head-to-head tiebreaker. Uh, we shall see. You could have the three-way ties where things could get a little interesting. Um, but we'll see how they play. So it's not over in the MEAC. This is a huge game this weekend between Morgan State and South Carolina as they host the Bulldogs. Jackson State Tigers defeated Mississippi Valley State. Delta Devils tried to keep it close early. Actually had a little bit of the lead. But uh, uh, Jackson State Tigers get going. And when they do, boy, they get the rolling. 51-14 to 14 final. Jackson State's for real, people. 8-2, and 6-0. We can get all that fancy talk with about these tiebreakers, whatever, but it's in their hands, and they have a chance to make a major statement uh, next weekend. Um, for y'all, y'all might wait to book your stuff, but as Mike said, uh, we plan to head to Jackson to cover everything, and I know, Charles, close your ears. You won't hear this. You, you got to go. Do <laughs> the but we can do what we do. I do yeah. ask you to do this for us, though. Make sure we got our, our plate and table. Now, over here, I need you to hear it. Reserve, <laughs> not a tease for us. Yeah. Now you can do what you want to do. Johnny T. Make sure you represent all our, all our Jackson State D.I. Yeah. Love players. We're going to be in town to yeah. see y'all do y'all thing. We, yeah. we like working with y'all. We'll be, yeah, we like having him. Y'all can have a whole restaurant. Just that place upstairs. That little table in the corner. <laughs> that little corner. That little, that little corner, corner right there. That's, all. That's, That's where all. we want. Give Johnny T. a call. <laughs> Charles, yeah. you, so you you don't have to wait to get this out. What do you thought about this weekend in the? Uh, 
Uh, let me start from the from the bottom up. I mean, a uh, big win for Tennessee State on the road. Uh, um, those are the type of wins that we have not seen Tennessee State get over the past uh, few seasons, but it's nice for them to get a big win on, win on the road. I keep saying it might not be aesthetically pleasing to watch, but Southern getting these wins, these improbable sort of wins, whether overtime or stealing victory out of the jaws of defeat against Texas Southern, you know, just something just kind of keeps building with them week to week. So dangerous team. It might not be look pretty, but dangerous team to me. Uh, for Alabama State to give up 10 points, I believe, in the fourth quarter, I did not think that would happen. Uh, kudos to Grandma for chasing them down against uh, one of the better defenses in the SWAC. And then uh, I'm, I'm a comeback to Prairie View in Florida and m But South Carolina State going on the road, getting that win against Howard, that was huge. And, and then Jackson State is just – they're just going to punch you in the mouth. I mean, they, when they start, when they get to running downhill, Irv Mullen gets to coming downhill, you know, put your hands up. I mean, that's, and, they, and they play with a chip on their shoulder. So very impressive to see them uh, actually go out and, and hammer Valley the way they did. Uh, Prairie View and Florida and m it has to be frustrating because that's the sort of potential that Prairie View has had all season. They were the more physical team yesterday. Uh, that was the thing that jumped out for me because I did not see this sort of physicality from them. But they, there were a couple of times they just punched FAMU in the mouth yesterday, and that jumped out for me yesterday. And I was like, wow, where has this been all season? It has to be a little bit frustrating for, for PB Particularly on a couple of those runs, you saw yeah. it. And you're absolutely right. A lot of Prairie fans are like, um, should have, would have, could have uh, in terms of the season. Uh, those tough four-quarter losses. And some of it was a lack of physicality all throughout the game. So people were excited about their win, but I'm not sure if they um, uh, were even maybe a little frustrated about thinking about a season that could have been. Mike? Yeah, let me let me start with the uh, Alabama State um, uh, game against Grambling. You know, I was watching that. You know, in, in the in the suite and whatever. I was a little bit disappointed at at Alabama State. I mean, after putting two uh, four hundred yards up, most of which was through third quarter, you would thought they had this game locked up. I mean. They literally had, you know, Gramlin, and Gramlin just wouldn't fight. So kudos to Gramlin. They wouldn't stop fighting. And, you know, this Alabama State defense, we talked about this defense, but they let, you know, Gramlin come back in the fourth quarter, you know, two touchdowns down. So uh, that one was, to me, threw me a little bit further. And even in the last few minutes, I think there was less than a minute, CB and I were watching it, Alabama State had the ball. They went down the field in three plays. Not one, not two, but three plays. Locked up well within the two, in the red zone and missed a chip shot. It just, I mean, it, that game just, throw, you know, perplexes me. Um, and then Southern, I don't know what to think of Southern with their three overtime wins this this week, but hats off to them for teams that never stop fighting. We said this West was going to be crazy. Gremlin never stops fighting. Southern obviously never stops fighting. We thought Bethune. We thought for a second, uh oh, here's a Bethune upset, and here comes Southern. It goes to the fifth overtime, and here they go with the win over Bethune. And uh, CB, you hit it on the nail for me. I was talking to so many uh, PV fans before the game, they're like, you know, do we have a puncher's chance in, in Hades to win this one? Well, we got to come out, hit them from the very beginning, hit them in the mouth. Hit him in the mouth and don't let up. And we were able to do that. And you talked about the defensive side, CB, but I'm going to talk about the offensive side. One of the Achilles tendons for uh, PV is not being able to put complete drives together. Where did this come from? Mm. They put complete drives. They had their mistakes, but they put complete drives against a solid FAMU defense. So I was scratching my head. I was you know, I didn't know whether to drink, celebrate, or be sad. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I chose all three. <laughs> Good stuff, Mike. Good stuff. I was like, where, where was this PV? I mean, that was the that was the theme after the game. Where was this against Southern? Where you know, where was this early in the season? We proved we could have, but you know, that's kind of where I, that's where I round out my session. Um, 
Where's and Great comments. Drink from last night. <laughs> Great comments, particularly with Alabama State. This is the first time we've probably seen Alabama State defense, quote unquote, fail them. They had bailed them out all season, so I don't want to like dump on them. But this is one that was crucial in terms of them not being able to make just one more play that they basically have made all season for this. The second thing is the special teams. We've seen yeah. Alabama State special teams cost them a game or two throughout the season or certainly make sure that they were in a couple of more games where the defense um, put them in position, they mixed field goals. Well, comes up again, uh, a field goal is uh, something that didn't let them get it done. A.D. Drew, your thoughts on the top seven before we take our second break, and then we get into the belling the top seven for week number 11. Uh, talk about Alabama State special team. Special is the word. They're either specially good or specially bad. So, and we, we've seen that uh, throughout the year with they, their special teams, is, like I said, made some plays that have been difference makers and then have not been made plays that have been difference makers. Disappointing, uh, like you said, Dr. Kavir, that the defense uh, failed them in this game, but how many of those W's that they have That's right. are because Absolutely. of that defense? Yeah. Bam, you. <laughs> Take the pause intentional. <laughs> you said potential. One of your one of you guys just said potential. Yes. Yeah. And with uh with prayer view. Well, the we, there's also been some potential at Florida AM University. And the potentially bad that a lot of Rattler fans that Charles always says I'm paranoid about showed up yesterday. <laughs> it finally showed up yesterday, Charles. All those things that I have been seeing, and not only me, myself, but other Rattler faithful have been seeing, showed up yesterday in, in Texas. So, Charles, it, it, it wasn't because I was afraid of everything. It, it's, it's a reality that family faithful are dealing with. We could have both championships sold up after this weekend. Yeah, it's going to take some math uh, for either Jackson State or Southern not to sew it up. But I will say this for Southern. Please do not let that Bayou Classic yeah. determine whether you make it to the championship game or mm. not. I would suggest that you sew it up this weekend. Last thing, uh, you know, being here in Atlanta uh, has a few privileges now. And I've uh, heard some rumors from people at Southwest Airlines, Delta Airlines, mm -hmm. Marriott, the Hilton, Holiday Inn, that, you know, reservations have started to take an uptake from the Mississippi area for the <laughs> second weekend <laughs> in Atlanta. I'm not sure what that's all about, but, you know, I'm just saying, you know, for the airline industry, the hotel industry contacts that I have here, they started to see some uh, reservations coming out the uh, greater Mississippi area. I, 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 help, help me decipher that, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I know what you're talking about. I think I know what you're talking yep. about. And it makes sense. I know, again, Charles, relax. This is us. We get to, we get to have fun. We get to be tight. That's your job. Be tight. We get to have fun. Now AD Drew gets to have fun. He ain't got to have be tight no more. Yeah. He, he went through that. I need to see that, the fan view when you come out and, you know, the, the paranoid fan view, except I needed the paranoid D I love that I've been on for so long. <laughs> exactly. With that, let's take our next break. We'll come back on the other side, and we're going to give you the top seven major division style, let you know where everybody fits up. We talked about the CIAA, SIEC, but we'll take the next break to give you the major division in week number 11. What's going on in the top seven? Any changes? Any team dropping out? New teams in the hunt? We shall see. Be right back after this break. Looking for the ultimate cultural experience of 2025? The Zora Outdoor Festival of the Arts is where you need to be. From January 31st to February 2nd, Eatonville, Florida will come alive with incredible live performances from the Lavert Experience and Sunshine Anderson. Immerse yourself in interactive art, Take a journey through history with a new virtual tour app that brings Eatonville's legacy to life from your phone. Enjoy family-friendly STEM activities and explore over 80 unique vendors. Please don't miss the unforgettable R&B tribute to the legends. 
this is more than a festival. It's a celebration of Eatonville's rich cultural heritage. Visit ZoraFestival.org for tickets or to become a vendor. We'll see you in Eatonville, the oldest black incorporated municipality in the country. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Camille inside the HBC Sports Lab, and I do think that's what Mike was talking about. Mike, like, how, that, that's Mike's sweet. I just want y'all to know. I think he lets me in. That is Mike's sweet. Big money, Mike. See, that's what happened. He's on assignment everywhere, but he's making that money. So I ain't, I ain't, I ain't making that money. I ain't mad at him, boy. He take care of the little bro. He take care of the little bro. Don't it, Charles? Don't it? Yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah, we go. Hey, don't, don't, we ain't got don't, to worry about nothing. The wine flows well around Mike. Right. The wine. <laughs> the, 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 the wine flows well. Yes, it did. <laughs> Yes, boy. <laughs> then, then he got this thing. Shot, shot, shot. I was like, what up, bro? We ain't calling no shot, shot, shot. After this game, boy. Shot, shot, shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And I ain't, you know, we seriously, we talk about it. We ain't talking about from the weapons either. This is a different type of shot. Y'all, you, you know what you don't know. But that being said, let's look at the top seven. Uh, just outside of the top seven, nobody dropped out. This is the first time all season, and you start to see this late in the season where teams coalesce, and they may shift in the top seven. But for the most part, it's pretty solid. And We've kind of had one team dropping out. This is the first week, over 11 weeks, essentially, that you had no team dropping out. But let's see those receiving votes. You do have a little change here in terms of receiving votes. Uh, Alcorn State Braves, five and five, five and two. They actually move up a spot. Uh, previous day, they were right outside, essentially at nine. They move up what would be at eight, the top team receiving votes. Panthers improved to five and five, three and three. Who would have thunk it? They even have a chance to have a win this season. Be interesting to see how that goes as the season plays out. Can they get that done? We shall see. They have another tough one against those Braves uh, next week. So the this Braves. game will essentially determine who gets in the top seven. They can close out things in a lot of ways. Uh, but we shall see. But the new entrance in terms of receiving votes is Morgan State Bears. They quietly are at five and five. And as I said, two and one, which means they do control their destiny uh, in a lot of ways, uh, particularly with the big game against South Carolina State coming up this week. With that being said, let's get to the big ones, the top seven. Let's see who's getting it done at number seven. Alabama State Hornets fall to five and four, four and two. They do slide two spots, but they do not fall out 159 points. They are still in the top seven at number seven. Bringing us to number six, Florida a &M, the Rattlers, if you would. They're five and four, three and two uh, in the mix in terms of them. They didn't fall out, but they also slide two spots at five and four, uh, three and two in that match. Bringing us to number five. Number five team is the Southern Jaguars, six and four, five and one. 174 points or six. I talked on the other side, as much as I talked about Clark Atlanta, I was not necessarily believing in the Southern Jaguar. But one thing I will say, uh, this is a team that knows how to finish. If you allow them to stick around, they will find a yep. way to get it done. That's apparent now. We can't question that anymore. That is a, certainly what they do. Uh, and they find a way to fight through matchups and find a way uh, to get themselves in a position where if you allow them to stick sneak around or be around that score, they'll find a way to make a key drive, a key stop, a key play to get it done. They are six and four, five and one, and they move up a slot to number five uh, as they close in on the Western Division. At number four, Tennessee State Tigers, they bounce back in a big way. They move up three spots, seven and three and four and two. Uh, they're outside of the race, if you would, but they have a chance to still push for a playoff bid 
and it's going to come down uh, to the number one team in that conference at the end of the season against Seymour. But they got one game to play before that. We'll see what that looks like as they uh, get there. Number three, North Carolina Central Eagles, six and three, two and one, one first place vote, 187 points. And three, they did not play this week. Uh, they are scoreboard watching, and what they watched on the scoreboard was not to their liking. Uh, this is a team <clears throat> that's going to have a solid season. You have to believe, but they might be on the outside looking in. At number two, you have those South Carolina State Bulldogs that caused that pain. They're at mm. two and three and oh, uh, four first place votes, 223 points at number two, and they are looking good at it. And are they on a collision? Of course, with number one, Jackson State Tigers, who sit at eight and two, six and oh, playing excellent football, six first place votes, 224 points. As you see, there's not much difference in the number one spot. A couple of key matchups, though, a couple of key road games will go a long way to say, is this going to be ultimately the Celebration Bowl? For right now, week number 11, this is a week-to-week -week poll. So let's talk about what is now. The Jackson State Tigers sit at number one, eight and two, six and oh, six first place votes uh, over uh, the two and three teams in the country. Imagine that uh, in terms of what that looks like uh, now. I'm going to go to you, A.D., uh, to start things off in terms of the major division. Poll rankings. What are your thoughts in terms of the top seven in week number 11? I'm going to start where I finished last week. And I'm going to start with who is the one person who is still giving Central a first place vote? Central hmm. has a bit of those six. They have a victory against Virginia Lynchburg. Yep. Come on now. Yeah, we know they played a couple of, uh, they played the FCS also. So a uh, like level competition, they are five. They are five and two. I mean, seven wins, eight wins. I mean, I don't care who you vote number one out of Jackson State and and South Carolina State when it comes to that. I know who I did, but neither one of them had Lynchburg on their schedule. I'm just gonna leave it right there with that one, uh, especially not playing this week. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wonder that. You know, there is a fan that we work with that's in North Carolina Central. I, I wonder how he's. Saying. He ain't got to be that is, one. Is that Josh? Is that, is that, is that, is that Josh? That is that Josh? That's all I want to know. Is, is, is it Joshua <laughs> Sam Senior? Josh, come on now. I need you to be unbiased. Leave exactly. your alumni card at home when you go to the polls, my brother. You know you can't campaign. You can't wear campaign T-shirts in the polls. You can't wear your alumni stuff. <laughs> when you go vote, bro. You got you got to vote. You got to remain neutral. Uh, BJ BJ Jones was Southern. He had maybe well, not no first place. But vote he didn't give one number one vote. Right, maybe maybe realistic. Yeah, uh, they do uh, have a show tonight after sports wrap, so yeah. we'll be checking that as well. With yeah, that being uh, said, I, want, I just want to hit. Tennessee. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm I sorry. Want to, I want yep. to hit Tennessee State. Tennessee State. A excellent chance of making the FCS playoffs. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that yeah. seven and three that Tennessee State has is a legit seven and three because yep. they are one of only two HBCU FCSs that play an entire FCS yeah. schedule. No D twos on the schedule. No FBS is on the schedule. So when the committee looks at that. That seventy three is a legit seventy three. Now yep. strength of schedule, yeah, we know they play valid. We know they play UAPB, so that's going to bring their strength of schedule down slightly. But that seventy three is a is a FCS uh, seventy three. Another victory probably gets them in, no matter what they do against Southeast Missouri. Mm. Obviously, a victory against Southeast Missouri. Is definitely lock going up. to a, a lock, lock to be, even though they can't. I don't think they can win the conference now, but that'll definitely put them in. And close your ears, John Grant, because I know you're watching. Potentially open up the debate on whether Tennessee State could be considered for the national championship. Should you know, should you get, and, I, and I'll say this, BJ Jones, should Southern be the team that wins the celebration bowl? Mm, interesting. Good spin. Right. Chaos. Chaos. Charles? 
Well, I, I tell you what, I, I think November 16th, uh, I think Mike, you touched on it. Beware of the eyes of November. Uh, huge one. Uh, with Jackson State going into Montgomery next weekend. Uh, hey, I can't say enough about the Montgomery Chamber of Commerce. You're going to make some money because uh, Tiger Nation is heading your way uh, this weekend. Expect a huge dosage of Jackson State fans making the trip. Uh, anytime Jackson State fan base starts smelling a championship, uh, it, it's something that <laughs> warms the cackles, if you will. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. I think first test of uh, – accomplished with regards to South Carolina State going on the road, knocking Howard off another one this weekend uh, versus Morgan State. Is that going to be another whiplash game where we start checking our phones like, uh-oh, you know. To, <laughs> so that's that's going to be a very interesting game. And then, you know, I think uh, Southern in, in the same sort of situation. They cannot afford to overlook UAPB. Still an explosive offense that can get things done. And the SEMO loss yesterday was uh, uh, interesting in regards to Tennessee State. You know, now I have, you know, in terms of taking a look at what Tennessee State has an opportunity to do against Southeast Missouri, I, I think that's uh, very interesting. AD, you touched on it, a legitimate seven wins with regards to Tennessee State's program. Impressive bounce back because in the latter part of the past few seasons, we've seen Tennessee State kind of slough off. Good stuff. Great, great comments for all. That's the poll rankings in week number 11. Let me give it to you again. We have Alabama State. Sitting at seven, at number six, the Florida a and Rattlers, at number five, Southern Jaguars, at number four, the Tennessee State Tigers, at number three, North Carolina Central Eagles, and number two, South Carolina State Bulldogs, and number one, second consecutive week, is Jackson State Tigers, as they hold it down in week number 11. With that, we'll take our next break. I know, Charles, you have to get out of here, as you will be doing sidelines for the SWAC championship game, women's soccer if you would down at prairie view uh mm -hmm. kicks off at what three o'clock uh one o'clock one o'clock one o'clock mm -hmm. and then it's a volleyball game that's at three o'clock that's uh at delmar for texas southern university uh with that being said the championship game on the women's side features uh two fir uh first time entrants in the final uh either one of these teams has a chance to hold up the trophy for the first time in their uh soccer history it's going to be uh texas southern versus southern jaguars that's the number one seed versus the number. What is Southern coming in seeding? Uh, I believe uh, Southern might have come in as the, if I'm not mistaken, maybe the number three seed. But very interesting matchup. Uh, Texas Southern. Uh, Victoria Pucci. She had a tremendous uh, soccer tournament last year, 2023. She's picked up again. Uh, she scored three goals in this uh, 2024 soccer tournament, going up against one of the best uh, goalkeepers in the SWAC in Sydney Bellamy. So it should be a, a really good soccer match. Uh, whoever comes through that, I mean, Southern came through uh, penalty kicks, a tremendous game uh, on this past uh, Friday night, knocking off Gramlin, who won the uh, SWAC soccer championship last year. Yeah, that's uh, seven penalty kicks it took uh, after a double overtime in a yeah. rainstorm. Shout out to Southern uh, getting it done against their rival, knocking off last year's champion. So it should be fat and to see what that looks like. With that being said, I'll be right back after this last break. Charles will jump off and we'll finish things up on a couple of key matchups. Be safe out there, Charles. Uh, we certainly be watching. With that being said, let's take our last break. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonya sent you. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot left. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, and sir. pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Let's get in this last segment talk about some matchups. We kind of teased this up when we did the mid-major and how teams 
fell out last weekend. But let's get into some of this matchup. Uh, we got championships on the line at the mid-major level. Uh, SIEC will feature uh, Clark Atlanta Panthers after a magical season. Can they get the final hump? Obviously, it's a rematch of what took place this season as they travel this time to Birmingham, the greater Birmingham area of Fairfield, to play the Miles College Bear, Golden Bears. So be fascinating in that matchup. Uh, so let's start right there. Um, AD, you've seen both of these teams uh, in terms of key matchups uh, and, and, and early on in different ways. But what are your thoughts in terms of the SIC championship game? coming up this week? Um, the one thing that I know is that Clark Atlanta will have to take care of the ball against Miles. They turned the ball over multiple times in their uh, previous matchup in Atlanta. I know they turned the ball over multiple times against Morehouse on yesterday. So that's going to be, I, and we know we know Teddy King's a gunslinger. He's got a gunslinger quarterback, but sometimes uh, calmer hand, heads have to prevail and know when to play conservative and when to, you know, go out and, ch and challenge someone. The Miles defense is not a defense that you need to challenge on a consistent basis. Pick your pick your spots now. For Miles, it's, it's, it's going to come down to the same thing as it did the first time. Can they get pressure on David Wright III? If they can get pressure on David Wright III, not allow him to get off schedule and make plays and contain him in the pocket, then Miles will uh, walk away with the victory in this, uh, in this particular matchup. They do have home field advantage. Uh, there was a question earlier. Someone asked about uh, why the championship game has been moved back to Atlanta uh, from Atlanta. I believe a lot of that had to do with the with the coaches. You know, the coaches have input on this, and they wanted to go back to the team with the best record, having the home field advantage. Yeah, if game was played in Lakewood Stadium, attendance wasn't the best. Uh, at Lakewood, so going back to the home field advantage, you know, that's number one, it's going to drive up attendance. And will we continue to see in the SIAC what we have seen in the SWACs as they have gone with the home team model and the home team winning another championship on their field? And by, by allowing that, that's going to allow either the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. For the fans of the host team. Good stuff. Great comments. And, and I agree with you. Uh, obviously, a lot of folks have watched and saw the, uh, if you would, success of the SWAC, uh, bringing the championship to campus, uh, the atmosphere that it brings. So I think uh, that was the indicator as well, particularly if you don't get the type of financial support in terms of having a neutral site. It's a difference if you can really get. Um, the support of the city or our sporting authority to go in on a neutral site. And once you kind of understand your value, the more you're going to request. And some cities may not see it at the same level. And we've kind of saw that go through with the SWAT. It's fascinating because neutral sites have a lot of uh, positive things, components, part of it. Uh, but you also have the campus sites. And it rewards the regular season champion uh, in terms of and they get they on bed. Yeah, for, for really getting it. So I like that and, and think that is intriguing. With that being said, let me go to you, Mike, in terms of your thought on this SIEC championship game that will feature two top seven teams out of the SIEC. So, you know, I know, you know, AD is, you know, you know, really the, the mid majors expert. So I defer to him a lot. I will just put up what I call question marks. You have two scores. Uh, and 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 Clark and Miles, you know, they both are, are seeing less, you know, more than thirty points a game, you know, averaging, you know, on statistically. However, that defense for Miles is tops. They're the best in the SIEC. We know that during the playoff games like this, championship defense travels. Another question mark, you know, and the the thing is, 
Clark Atlanta defense is, is not rated. They've been kind of fluctuated at times. They perform when they needed to, but that consistent defense of Miles is hard to get over. And then you look at the rushing game, and you look at Miles leading. That's another thing that travels, being able to control the ball and rush and have a strong rushing game. Uh, whereas uh, statistically, and you look at the course of the game, you know, Clark Atlantis does not look to be as strong. The other thing is if you look at the course of the games, that margin of victory for Miles has been, on. you know, if you look at their wins this season, has been at least two touchdowns, give or take, nominally, whereas Clark Atlanta has won. But, you know, their wins have been one touchdown, maybe field goal or difference or whatever. Exactly. So those are three or four question marks that are sitting in the back of my mind as we see this game playing in Atlanta. I love the location. I love the idea of taking it on the road. But I wonder now when you say, you know, taking it on the road, which team's, you know, defense is going to really show up, especially in a championship environment. And then you look at that part, that margin of victory for Clark over the course of eight, nine games. You know, good, great story this season, but can it really show up? So those are the question marks that kind of sit in the back of my head with this matchup. Great breakdown by both of y'all. Let's turn the page and go over to the CIAA. This time it's all Virginia thing, and it will be in Virginia, so you imagine you're going to have a nice crowd from both teams representing, as this time it's for a championship. Virginia Union versus uh, Virginia State. Uh, you get the old mojo with the little fight back with Virginia Union being upset. How far does that play to turn around a week later and play the team you just played for a championship? This one is in a neutral site, so that should be fascinating to see how that plays out. Uh, some people would think home field advantage would be worth seven. So now you're talking about this being a quote unquote even matchup. So sticking with you, Mike, uh, looking at this top seven matchup, you would essentially say uh, between Virginia State Trojans and the Virginia Union Panthers. Yeah. And you look at teams that on paper, they seem, you know, statistically evenly matched. If you look at offensive and defensive output, and then, you you know, you look at the rushing capability and you see that Virginia Union is heads and tails above everyone else. I think Virginia State is third or fourth in the conference. And then you say, well, who's leading the pack? And it's one none other than Jada Byers. Is this going to be that time for him to step up uh, and really show you how good we know he is? Um, and a game as important to this, and I think he will. So I, I think that's going to be a real important uh, factor if you look at how these teams match up. And then you look at defense against the run, you know, and, and where, you know, Virginia State is, they're, you know, third or fourth. You know, Virginia Union falls down a little bit. So, you know, I think that's one statistic is, you know, you know, can one team rush better than the other? I think Jada Byers is set to have, a, you know, another Jada Byers type game. And I think that'll be one key stat. Um, the other thing is, I, I don't know, I'd have to defer to, to AD. I know these two have a long playing history. They're 20 miles, give or take, from each other. What's the record against these two? And what's the record in a championship setting? That, I don't know. I think that's got to come to play as well. So, interesting matchup. Good one. Let me go to you, Drew, and get your thoughts on this CIAA champion. Again, that'll feature essentially top five teams of the top seven. We'll see exactly where that falls out on Tuesday. And we'll even take a deeper dive after we unveil the mid-major poll rankings on Tuesday and get into the key championship matches between the CIAA and SIEC. But now we're talking about the CIAA. What are your thoughts in terms of a rematch? Uh, uh, just a week before, you know, we get rematches. We get that in the SIEC. But there's been a couple of weeks before that. This comes down to rivals at the end of the season playing in a conference game, and they find a way, both teams, to be in a championship the following weekend with this new format that removed the northern and southern divisions, uh, similar to what you saw in the SIEC the second year that they've done that, removing the east and western divisions. What are your thoughts in terms of the CIAA championship next week? I'm going to start off with Mike's uh, last question, Mike. First time they played each other in the championship setting because it's the first time that we have not had divisions. Usually these two teams are playing each other last week and under the old format, Union will be sitting at home. Virginia State will be playing in the championship. Now, 
they get they get an opportunity to run it back, as as they like to say. You know, you talk about the neutral site. I don't think the CIAA could have planned this any better when they did this, that the first year that they go away from this, you've got Virginia State and Virginia Union playing at your pre-chosen neutral site in Salem, Virginia. Now, these schools are 30 minutes from each other, but they got they both got to drive almost three hours for the neutral site game. So it's going to be, it's, this is our first case study, Dr. Cavill, of not only, you know, teams playing back-to-back -back weeks in a regular season matchup and a championship game that, that we have seen that I can think of in any of these uh, championship game uh, scenarios since we've gone to the championship game. And then we also have the case study of the neutral site within the same state. Will the fans travel or won't they travel? And the fans who aren't traveling, are they not going to travel because they just saw this last week? Or are they not going to travel because to some people it makes no sense for me to travel three hours to go see the team that I normally travel 30 minutes to go see. So that, that's going to be interesting. Last mm -hmm. thing I'm going to talk about this, and this is not necessarily with the matchup, but this is with the conference in general. Last, last week we saw three teams who were ranked in the top seven. Virginia Union, Johnson C. Smith, and Western Salem State. And I'm talking about the regional rankings, everybody. Uh, so with everything that happened, with Johnson C. losing, Western Salem winning, Virginia State, who was on the outside looking in, winning, what is this going to really do with the regional rankings? And can Clark Atlanta sneak back up in there with a victory against a miles because I, I say to say they they won't get anything with the victory against Morehouse does nothing for their, their ranking except 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 it just looks good on paper that they got another W uh within the region in division two. But with a victory for my against Miles, should they upset Miles get be enough to get the SIAC into ranking because remember Miles was at the was at the last spot before this game. And also, what did the Miles victory against Tuskegee do for their regional ranking? Was that able to bump them up a slot or two so that even if they lose to a Clark Atlanta and a couple other dominoes fall, Miles could still sneak in. Right. So it's going to be real interesting this afternoon when the regional rankings come out to see what's going on. Is Winston-Salem still hanging around? Is Johnson C. Smith still hanging around? Can Virginia State get in there? So I, 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 I inquiring minds want to know. We'll talk about it tonight on the sports wrap up. You know something, Dr. Kabir? Yep. Football season is over with for me. I might be back on Sunday night now. Oh, nice. Nice gotta, surprise. Gotta, 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 gotta stay tuned to watch out. Huh? Let's see if that happens. Good tease. Great tease. With that being said, let's flip it to the major division. Uh, John Grant, executive director of the MIAX White Challenge Celebration Bowl, said he was looking for all seven of the top seven fans uh, to be in the house for the Celebration Bowl. What's fascinating about that, I'll be interested to see if he's going to be on the road in Morgan and see if South Carolina State can wrap things up. You know, oftentimes he comes with his official invitation. When teams have a chance to grab it, will the Bulldogs grab it? Uh, with that being said, just before we close out on the mid-majors, while we're talking about the playoffs, which is certainly uh, what we need to be talking about this year, you know, we talked about last week that there will be no Florida Beach Bowl. That featured invitations to teams that were not in the playoffs. But imagine if the CIAA and SIAC join forces and decide to follow the lead of the MIAC and SWAC and have a championship game. What would that look like? What kind of discussions would that be going on this week to see a possible matchup between Virginia State and a Miles or Virginia State and a Clark Atlanta or Virginia Union and a Clark Atlanta, Virginia Union and a Miles? Well, not this year, but it's interesting and something that we think about. I wonder if John Grant has his hand in the cookie jar uh, as he tends to find a way to mix it up. I don't know. 
Yep, you looked in your cookie jar. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just putting that out there and giving uh, some things for John to think about. Not that he doesn't have enough on his plate already, but, you know, we always challenge him. Sometimes we challenge him creating a Miak Swack challenge for basketball, men's and women's. Uh, maybe now we even pushing for a bowl game for the Division Two. What would that look like? Besides that, this is the weekend I was really looking forward to. I don't know if people realize that, and it's really going to play out with some key matchups in different ways. You got three straight days where you get HBC football uh, on the television. It starts Thursday. You have a Thursday matchup with Grambling at Alabama A&M. Uh, Grambling comes in at 5-5 five and five after a big victory. Alabama A&M had their victory as well at 4-5. and five. Grambling travels to Huntsville on a Thursday. We'll get to watch that. Then you turn around on Friday. You go to the MEAC and you get a Howard versus North Carolina Central. Obviously, this matchup was crucial. 250-point spots the last two years between these teams. And both teams, whoever won this game, had played for a uh, championship in the Celebration Bowl. Looking on the outside, looking in for both these teams, a little more Howard on the outside than Central, but they need some big breaks. Uh, but they got to do their part first on Friday with the Friday matchup that will be on ESPNU as things start on Thursday on ESPN with the swag. As I said, this is Howard versus Central. Howard comes in at four and six. North Carolina Central is six and three. And then you have your Saturday matchups, which features Delaware State and Norfolk State staying in the MEAC. You got South Carolina State at Morgan State, which I'm sure is the one I'll ask you a little more about. And then you have Saturday, you have the other five matchups in the SWAC, which feature Mississippi Valley at FAMU, Jackson State at Alabama State, UAPB at Southern, Bethune-Cookman at Texas Southern, and Alcorn at PV. Again, let's start with the Saturday matchup early at 3 o'clock. I think that's South Carolina State at Morgan State. This one is key, as I said. Morgan State controls People quietly don't realize that, but they control their destiny if they want a ticket to the Celebration Bowl. South Carolina State is saying not so fast. We know that, and we want our own ticket back. We've seen and been to the Celebration Bowl and had fun. We won a championship there. We like a little bit about that, and we want to get back to it and see what we can do again. So let's talk about that matchup, starting with you, A.D. Drew. South Carolina State at Morgan State on Saturday, 3 o'clock uh, matchup. Fascinating to see. Where are you going with that game? It's real simple for me. Will Morgan State find a way to muster up some type of offense? Number one. Number two. Or will South Carolina State make enough mistakes where their Morgan State defense can either manufacture their own points or put the Morgan State offense in the position where they don't have to drive the ball down the field, i.e., a turnover defense, uh, South Carolina State ter territory, giving a uh, giving a Morgan State offense a real short field. That's going to be the key because other than that, it's going to be South Carolina State by thirty in this mm -hmm. game, unless this unless this Morgan State defense can somehow force South Carolina State to to make. To make mistakes, or they they get a miracle, and I hate to say it, I'm going to say this: they have a Prairie View like performance against South Carolina State next week. I think that's appropriate. You have to hate to say that. I think that's very appropriate. I'm gonna go to you, Mike. This is essentially a top ten matchup as we unveil the rankings. You have number two South Carolina State on the road at essentially what would be number ten Morgan State Bears. At five and five, two and one in the conference race, South Carolina State comes in undefeated in conference, three and zero. Oh. They're seven and two overall. Fascinating in terms of this. While folks focus on Morgan State defense and what they can do on offense, the last two games they've had an offensive explosion. They scored thirty eight two weeks ago in an overtime victory over Norfolk State, thirty eight to thirty seven. And then last weekend they put up thirty six. Uh, what's interesting to me is the defense has kind of faltered and kind of came back to earth, giving up uh, 36 last two weeks going in 28 uh, against Delaware State. Uh, so I'm fascinated to hear what you think of this, Mike, in terms of this crucial matchup uh, between uh, South Carolina State and Morgan State. 
Stop it, dog. Stop it. Stop. <laughs> Just stop it. It's not all that. It, 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 it's, it's barely simple, as, as AD said. You know, Morgan State, their best friend is their defense. They held the number one team in the MEAC, North Carolina Central, to 16 points. It was a 16 to 7, 16 to 8 game. Their defense is their best friend. Yes, they have an offense. You cited their their offense the last two games where they played Norfolk State and I believe Delaware State. Come on. Those teams are one in a million together. Yes, they're going to put up some points. So stop it. Stop it. It's all about can their defense show up and is South Carolina State going to make some mistakes? You know, against good defenses, yes, they have been prone. North Carolina Central, also very good defense. You know, that game was tit for tat. But still, South Carolina State found a way to pull it out. So it's simple. Can their defense show up? And can South Carolina State have a blip or blunder, dare I say, a prayer view moment or what? And, but Or can Morgan State keep it close with their defense in the midst of South Carolina State having just a, that one of those kind of days? It's that simple. Stop it. I know we want to hype it up, but it's that simple. <laughs> With that being said, I'm going to stick with you, Mike. Let's switch over to the SWAC and give some comments. They say too much PV talk. Well, we're going to get into some Jackson State and Alabama State talk. It's time to go to the gump. Jackson State comes in at number one. They bring their number one ranking on the road to a top seven Alabama State team uh, that had a tough road loss against Grambling, but there's still a fighting chance in the race. Uh, and regardless of the records, this is one of those intriguing matchups where Alabama State always plays Jackson State tough. Uh, they'd be interesting in this matchup because it's crucial. It's for a championship. Jackson State with the win, they lock it up, period, point blank. With the loss, things can get interesting that last weekend. Jackson State comes in not just number one, but they're 8-2 and two overall, 6-0 and oh in conference race undefeated. They play Alabama State. That is 5-4 and four overall and 4-2 and two in the conference race. One versus seven. Uh, the seven-team host number one coming in. Mike, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of this key matchup? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think Jackson State, and, you know, if we had this conversation three or four weeks ago. You say, all right, this Alabama State defense, this game could go either way. They're going to Montgomery. This could go either way. I think Jackson State comes in with a lot of momentum, and unless they really flub the dub. And what I mean, what do I mean by that? If you look at where they are now compared to, you know, two or three weeks ago, Jackson State is hands the best offense, second in the league in defense. You got number one, Alabama State, with their defense. But what we've seen in the last three or four games, if you pay attention and you watched them, I watched two of their games, their defense has been prone to fail them in the third and fourth quarter. I don't know what happens or what. Can their defense play the entire game? Then they can make it interesting against Jackson State who could probably outscore them. Because if you look at it, I think uh, Alabama State is not tops in the league in scoring. Their defense is what gets them. They're still on, what, number four, number five, number six quarterback? Mm -hmm. I think they even try not quarterbacks for the band. So, but they still find <laughs> a way to win. Um, and, and, and when they run the ball and run the ball effectively, they can beat anybody. It's just, is their defense going to pl try uh, play well? And are they going to play for all four quarters? Jackson State is really Jackson State's own worst enemy. I think they come in with too much momentum. We have this game three or four you know, weeks earlier. It's a different discussion. But now we've seen what both teams can do when there's a lot of money on the line. So, you know, those are my thoughts. I think Jackson State comes in with a lot of momentum. If they don't, you know, have a fam you like day and forget that they can play football, I think Jackson State moves forward. Good comment by HBC Overdrive. Uh, Jackson State is rushing for what? 275 yeah. yards per game in the last four games. That is crazy to think. Well, yeah. obviously what is going to happen here is can the Alabama State uh, defense, can they stop the rush? Jackson State yeah. is not going to come in there quiet about it. They're going to try to run the ball and run it down their throats, which is fascinating because they do seem to wear teams down. And if anything, that's been a problem for Alabama State, particularly as not being able to get so much offense going. They tend to wear down in games. They've been able to hold on. They couldn't 
hold on this past weekend. Will that continue to play out? A.D. Drew in this top seven matchup. Number seven is hosting the number one team, Jack State Tigers, coming in in essentially a conference. Eastern Division title is on the line for all purposes, if you would, in this matchup. What are your thoughts, A.D. Drew? Uh, there's no way Jackson State should lose. But you know what makes the month of November interesting, yep. fellas? Yeah. That yep. thing called injuries is what gets a lot of teams in November. We saw what happened yesterday when Richardson got knocked out of the game early in the game, and which allowed y'all to come in and talk cash money about Florida A&M. <laughs> and, 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 and just, just being real, if Richardson plays that entire game, you guys still may get the victory, but you, you don't beat FAMU the way you beat FAMU yep, on yesterday. I agree. I agree. Backups are backups for a reason. Correct. Coaches who do not play a two-quarterback system do not play a two-quarterback system for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yep. So let, let's let's keep that in mind. That quad strain turns into a quad pull this time of the year. So long as nothing crazy like that happens to Jackson State, then Jackson State walks away with this particular game. I'm going. I I know we got a couple more games, and I'm going to say this quickly. Just think what our discussions would be if we weren't talking about divisions. We would still have Jackson State one. We would still have Southern two, Southern two, but teams number three and four and possibly five would be on Southern's heels right now and would really lead to interesting conversations instead of us talking about both races are, could possibly be done after this weekend and the only thing left to determine is the host. Yep. Well, we, we'll talk about these games a little bit more on Thursday. Uh, we'll probably touch on some of them Tuesday, but we'll dedicate most of Tuesday in terms of the unveiling of the mid-major poll rankings and the two championships, CIAA, SIEC. We'll talk about the NIA programs in terms of the Langston and Florida Memorial. Uh, as they move through things, we'll make sure that they get a little bit of love as well. Uh, but the three other matchups that are fascinating this weekend that have uh, divisional implications on the line will be UAP at Southern. Southern has played actually better on the road, uh, but UAPB after that big television win over Prairie View has kind of come back to earth. So um, can they do some magic and hold can off Southern? Southern, can Southern not go to overtime this weekend. Then you have Alcorn at Prairie View. Uh, Prairie View is trying to find a way to have a winning season after things have kind of went south. Close out the home and send the seniors with the win at home. But you got Alcorn State that is just outside of it. They still believe they have a chance at the Western Division. And if things play in a role, uh, they will need to get the victory to put them some pressure on Southern to keep things going. So that's an interesting uh, matchup for uh, that reason. So kind of fascinating. The other one is Tennessee State. We talked about them as the independent. They're on the road. A seven and three Garner Webb is four and six. They need that victory to put themselves in a a shot at maybe sharing a championship. Uh, as Simo had their first loss of the season, so they're at five and one. And UT Martin, uh, which they lost to Tennessee State, the close matchup, so they're five and one. Uh, but Tennessee State is four and two, along with Tennessee Tech that they got a victory over. So this is uh, a key matchup in terms of them showing that they've turned it. Uh, whether it's a shot at the conference, more importantly, making sure they put themselves in the best position possible for a playoff bid. So it'll be interesting to kind of see how that looks. Eddie George is closing out on, uh, unlike maybe last season, can he close out the season strong with the, with some wins uh, to kind of turn the page in the corner of what he's building at Tennessee State. Fascinating to see how that'll match up. So those are some key matchups that we'll talk about later this week. Uh, but I will do this. I'll give you kind of final thoughts, and then we'll close it, call it a show. Eddie Drew, what are your final thoughts in terms of as we go down the stretch uh, for some conference championships, closing out the HBCU season will ultimately lead into some playoffs, uh, celebration bowl bids, and national championships uh, for these football teams that are still in the hunt. Southern has played count on fellas. 10 overtime periods this season. 
to get two wins. <laughs> can can Southern not allow UAPB to take them to overtime? Can we get a winner? Can we get a loser in the sixty minutes allotted for this game? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm just I'm just asking, but. This game kind of scares me because UAPB is a team that can sneak up on Southern and Southern is not focused. So I'm going to leave it right there. But that's the one game that I really want to keep an eye on is that Southern UAPB game. Will Southern come out and play ball like they should? Or will Southern revert back to the scary Southern that we have seen so often? You know, Cats have nine lives, but Southern plays 10 overtimes. Good one. Mike, what are your final thoughts? Oh, no, uh, I guess that was, you know, one of mine was UAP. Of all the teams we're talking about Southern playing, they, you know, we were talking earlier, don't let the game come, the decision come down to the Bayou Classic. Let's not look UA, overlook UAPB for that very reason. Um, I didn't get a chance to comment on the major poll earlier, but I would say, man, how much of an argument would it be that Tennessee State is the number three team? That – I agree that they're seven and three record or whatever it is. They're legitimately in second or third place in the OVC. And any time in the past, they've even made it to the middle. We've questioned their, you know, their games, the wins especially, and their schedule. This without question, this Tennessee State team is a legitimate number two or three, uh, arguably, in your polls. And w- depending on how the math plays out, who wins the losses, could we be at least could they enter the conversation at the end of the year as a potential black college championship? Just saying, just just arbitrary thought. But you know, going back to your question, yes, I think that UAPB Southern game will be very interesting. Um, as well as uh to me the um the Jackson State, Alabama State, just to see can that Jackson State continue the momentum. So Great points. Great make points made by both of you. I'm good to see that you got to have some comments in the top seven. Certainly wanted to make sure you had that. A.D. Drew spoke a little bit about that, too, Tennessee State being a spoiler. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, and so we still have some meaningful games, intriguing games, intriguing matchups, but that'll do it for us today. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share your pod, our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Yadika Ville, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, A.D. Drew, uh, giving us some thoughts as well. Again, we want to thank you for listening. Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. That is Central Standard Time. So that's Sunday at 9 a.m. We'll give you that update. I will be on the road next Sunday, so look for these gentlemen to give you your update reports if I can't get some change with the flights, but we'll still give you a show on Sunday. Um, and so stick with us in terms of today. Uh, it looks like AD drew might surprise you and be back in the mix of sports rap. His football season is officially over, uh, in terms of culminating with the, uh, big cl- classic, if you would Morehouse in Clark Atlanta. With that being said, stick around and see if you can see what's going on there and see if he is able to show up for sports rap with Brian. Back with a D, if you would. Uh, after that, you have HBC United and a couple of other things in the mix. Um, so you can close out your Sunday with some HBC football reports. We'll be back on Tuesday to give you an update on the mid major poll rankings, those championship games, they're on the line, SIC, CIAA, uh, and some key matchups in the major division that we talked about starting on Thursday with uh, Ramblin' uh, traveling, if you would, to. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama, taking on the Bulldogs of Alabama a and Then on Friday, you have the Howard uh, traveling to North Carolina Central, taking on the Eagles, uh, if you would, in that matchup. With that being said, that'll do it for us today uh, in these matchups. We look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, that's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L on Facebook and Instagram. Inside the HBC Sports Lab on Facebook and YouTube. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. AD Drew? Of course. Mike? Lecture. Dismissed.